Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> Joining me today is Keith R.A. DeCandido, a prolific author known for his work with media tie-ins, including Alien, Star Trek, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Doctor Who, and Dungeons and & Dragons. His new urban fantasy novel, A Furnace Sealed, follows his character Bram Gold, a Bronx-based freelancer tasked with investigating and containing supernatural mishaps and malefactions. When his latest job, wrangling a rogue unicorn, cascades into a wave of dead immortals, Bram and his compatriots must find the murderer before their actions summon something far worse. A Furnace Sealed is available now from Wordfire Press. And Keith, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. We did a panel together in Kansas City at Planet Comic Con a month or so back. And I, as much as possible, I try to uh, record the audio from panels so that I can share them later on. Um, and unfortunately, at Planet, usually that's just not an option for me the way the boards and stuff are set up. So, and I think it was funny that we were, we had a panel that more or less got panel bombed by Brandon Sanderson <laughs> at the last minute that we didn't know that he was going to be a part of it until literally minutes before the panel got started. But it ended up being a really great time. I wish I, I had the audio from it because I think it was a really good conversation. But that was the first time I'd met you, and so I was excited to read your book afterwards and get you on the show. So I gave the the little description, like in my words, of what a furnace sealed is about. Can you kind of elaborate on it? Well, actually, that was a really good that was a really good summary of it, and I may steal what you did. The basic premise of the series, which is the Adventures of Bram Gold, is a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx who hunts monsters. He is, as you said, a freelancer. He he is a, a what's called a courser, which is a fancy term for somebody who can be hired to deal with various supernatural phenomena. If a unicorn has gotten loose, if there's a leprechaun wandering around your garden, um, if a nixie has gone crazy somewhere, or you need someone to mind your werewolves on the night of the full moon, he's the guy you call. There are a whole bunch of coursers all over the world who do this. It's kind of a subculture that's not well known to the general public, but supernatural phenomena are managed uh, locally by what's a person known as the war dean who is somebody who manages is in charge of maintaining all magical activity uh, and supervising all magical activity within a particular geographical region a lot of the work that coursers get comes directly from war deans who discover things that are going on and need to, to hire them and then there's a curia that supervises the the war deans all around the world we haven't actually seen the curia yet my focus on the series in a lot of ways is Brom gold is not a chosen one he is not destined for greatness he is not, you know, the greatest courser who ever lives. He's just a guy doing his job. That's part of what I'm, I'm going for here is that while, while Brom does have nasty adventures and, and has to be the hero and, and win the day and all that, all that other stuff, he is basically a guy who is working for a living. This is his job his way of, of feeding and clothing and housing himself. And and that's also true of the wizards that he deals with. It is true to a lesser extent of the Wardeen and of the other coursers. They're all people who are who are doing their jobs. And the various creatures they deal with are also just people for the most part. And some of them, yes, do horrible things and some of them are are pains in the ass and have to be reeled in. But it's it's the same ratio that you would get if you had a normal group of humans who do that. So you know the, the courser's job is basically to be more or less police for the magical realm on a freelance basis. Another part of the series is also focusing in particular on the Bronx. Lots of people write fiction set in New York City. The vast majority of those actually take place in Manhattan, south of 125th Street. There is an entire rest of the city. <laughs> and yeah, there are five boroughs. And the only other borough that ever gets any play at all is Brooklyn, maybe. Upper Manhattan is often ignored. Queens is often ignored. Staten Island is often ignored. And the Bronx is often ignored. And there's a lot of stuff happening all over the city. It's a very large, diverse multifaceted city and Manhattan's only a part of it. It's the most famous part, but it's not the only part. And so uh, a lot of what I'm trying to accomplish here is to do a story that takes place in the setting of the Bronx with, with what makes that particular portion of New York unique, you know, I like what you were saying there about how Brahm is basically sort of a, a working class hero, right? Like he's a guy and maybe even hero stretching it pretty far because he's he's just a dude going about his work because he's he's got this job as a courser, but then he also splits time working at like an ER because he actually is a doctor, but it's not like his sort of primary thing. It's interesting to have a set of these characters that are living in a world where the magic stuff around them is is actually kind of mundane to them in a lot of ways. I mean, very early 
early on, Brom has to go wrangle f- like four people who are actually werewolves because, you know, once a month they turn into wolves and then have to be just kind of taken care of for a little while before it wears off. And instead of it being like, oh, my God, the werewolves are here. They're like, yeah, yeah, you know, Mark and Katie and, and the group are going to turn into werewolves. Like, we got to get them taken care of, take them to the dog park. Right. And I think that's a really fun kind of approach to it. So, I mean, looking at this, you know, from the standpoint of like an urban fantasy story and is there such a thing as cozy urban fantasy <laughs> i don't know but I, that's as good a description as any for this if something can be cozy when it's in the middle of an urban center i mean i always think of cozy as taking place in you know a small town 30 miles outside london but uh, having said that yeah i suppose um i mean there's still big things happening you know i mean the the, the threat that that eventually comes out is a major one that has to be dealt with but uh I like co- cozy fantasy. I may I may start using. I may I may steal that one. Too. Sure, sure. Well, you know, <laughs> my, you know, my thing about it, like we've got so much uh, storytelling now where it feels like the escalation of things always has to be like it's like we solve this or it's the end of the world. You know, like everything has like this just escalated stakes. But then if you go over like to the mystery genre, you do have like cozy mystery, and it's very very popular as as a genre where people like read these contained stories that are kind of more about people. You know, the stakes are maybe not amazingly high but still very high for a small handful of people and this one i felt like even though it does have the sprawl of new york city around it it is in a borough it is with a a group of people that kind of know each other and and have a community and yeah and it just it didn't because it doesn't have that chosen one narrative going on with it either it felt just a little bit more self-contained that's why i thought like cozy urban fantasy was what came to mind for it i like that i mean part part of it is also trying to show how the community of a subculture works whether it's you know a, a well-known subculture or one that that is more private. T- two particular examples that come to mind are the scuba diving community, which I particularly think of in terms of of the fact that scuba diving is very self-regulated. There are rules of diving that are not codified in any sense that you're not going to get arrested or anything if you if you break these rules. But every reputable dive shop follows them. You know, if you don't have the right equipment, nobody's going to rent you a boat. If you try to go diving alone, nobody's going to rent you a boat because you're always supposed to dive with a buddy. Things like that. It's it's the idea of something that is self-regulated rather than regulated externally. And another one I'm thinking of is also the BDSM community, which mostly, you know, hides in plain sight, as it were. They, they have their own clubs where they manage them, again, where they, they self-police and aren't particularly public or known to the general public. But within their community, it's, it's a very tight community where they all take care of each other and everybody, you know, knows – what everybody else is doing within that community and and keeps track of each other so that that that's kind of what i was going for here with the magic community as well with the, the supernaturally aware community in the adventures of brown gold i also wanted to to some extent also embrace the diversity of where i live i've lived in new york my entire life and i see a lot of different types of people all the time i think i may have actually said this on the uh on the panel we were on or it may have been another one i've been doing a lot of conventions lately partly to promote this book but um <laughs> I say this as a cishet white dude. I am pretty much done with cishet white dudes. The the only exception that I've made, and Brahm is an example, are basically for Jews and Italians because you don't see them either very much. Jews are still basically considered a um, subculture that is that is still persecuted with depressing regularity still. And in terms of, of popular culture, you very rarely see Italian-Americans as anything other than mobsters or comic relief or both. It's easy to forget that uh, when they first came to this country, Italians were were treated horrible. The largest single mass lynching in American history was not of African-Americans. It was of Italians. So part of it was was just a general anti-Catholic bias, which also hit Irish immigrants as well. So I, I try very hard to have my fiction reflect what you see in the Bronx, which is white people, black people, brown people, Asian people. Uh, all sorts of different ethnicities, all sorts of different cultures, all th- sorts of different sexual preferences, all mushed together in this borough. That ha- the borough by itself, by the way, has twice the population of this the entire state of Alaska, and that and and we're the least populous, well, the second least populous of the five boroughs. <laughs> so there's a lot of people here, and we and a lot of us live in very large apartment buildings um, or houses that are really mushed close together. So um, you know we're all we're all up in each other's business, and so that that I wanted to reflect that in the book as well. 
I'm from a very, very small rural town in Illinois um, that was about 7,000 people when I was there, all white. Or I should say like 99.97% white, you know. But in the years since I left that town, um, I actually used to work out of New York City um, because I worked at Hot 97 uh, there in town and uh, when I was working on radio. And so I was there pretty frequently and I had friends who lived in Brooklyn and stuff. So, um, you know, I've been out there a bunch and elsewhere in the country. And the thing I think it's interesting where you have people who are really part of singular communities that are fairly homogenized is that when they see – stories or fiction or films, whatever, that show a great deal of diversity, they often have this like, oh, they're shoehorning in, you know, a lot of people just for the sake of diversity. And I'm like, no, that's just what their world looks like. You know, you go elsewhere and this this is just the day-to-day life. If you're in New York City and you leave your home for any length of time, you're going to talk to people that have different accents that are from different places that have accents and still were that are third generation Americans, you know, and that, that's just a part of the everyday existence. And I think sometimes for people that are really kind of like wrapped up in this small bubble, like it's, it's sometimes it's hard for them to, you know, to be conscious of that because their world doesn't look like that. So, so I am always happy to see that. I do think it's interesting as uh, somebody who is not from New York city, but, uh, but is familiar with the city that New York writers um, that write about the city write about it with a kind of specificity that I feel like not a lot of other people <laughs> write about with their locales. It feels very universal. And I wonder, like, I really wonder what, what it is about that. Like, like new, because I, it's something about like New Yorkers know their street names and know their cross streets and the nature of that city in a flow in a way that I feel like most people don't like in my little suburban community, I think I could name three streets here and I feel like most everybody around is about the same. So, I mean, like, what is it about New York and living there and writing about it that kind of inspires that specificity? Probably and reading and seeing so many works of fiction that get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I love doing is is pointing out – and I don't love it as much, but I, I, I wind up doing is, – is, is noticing and pointing out errors – in the geography and in the uh, and in various other aspects of New York in works of fiction that purport to take place there. And since so many works of fiction take place there, you know, and, and sometimes it's just, you know, bits of amusement, which is not in anybody's control. Like an episode of Law and Order will have, you know, a scene in a bar in Brooklyn, except the location they got was a street in the Bronx. And so anybody from who's from the neighborhood will know, hey, that's not Brooklyn, but it doesn't matter. It's just it looks like it's a street that looks like a street in Brooklyn. It's fine. One of my favorite examples in TV shows you can, where you can tell that they looked at a map but have never actually been there. So you'll have somebody not from New York refer to Sixth Avenue as Avenue of the Americas. Technically, it is called Avenue of the Americas. Nobody in New York City ever calls it that. <laughs> it is Sixth Avenue to everybody. But on a map, if you look at a map, it says Avenue of the Americas. So you can that, that's kind of how you can tell the tourists. But um, <laughs> little things like that. And because so many things take place in New York and it's wrong so often, I think that that may be part of it is just sort of a, a backlash of that. And also we like our city, I guess, because it's such a large city, people tend to know the areas they're in very well. Every neighborhood has its own thing. Every neighborhood has its own particular way of being. But there's also stuff all over the place. So that might be part of it, too. And and one of the things that I had to be reeled back in on is getting too specific. I had three editors on this. Conveniently, I am both married to and the son of professional editors. <laughs> so I can say my mother or my wife read it and it actually means something because they will call me on my nonsense when I screw things up. And one of the things that Ren, my wife, uh, pointed out when she was reading through A Furnace Sealed was that I was I was turning it into too much of a triptych through the Bronx and I didn't need to be that specific a lot of times. What what you read was actually better than what I originally wrote. <laughs> and and I may still have overdone it. I, I do I like writing about New York, not just the Bronx, but I mean I I have set a ridiculous amount of my fiction in New York, uh sometimes whether it needs to be or not. I mean, certain things I've written like I've written two Spider Man novels, which obviously take place in New York. Right, yeah. I've written a CSI New York book, same thing. But I also wrote uh, I've written three supernatural novels and one of those took place in New York as well. I actually wrote a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novel that took place in New York in 1977. Um, I wrote a, a book uh, called Blackout, which focused on one of the previous Slayers, the one Spike killed on the subway that he got his leather jacket. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I basically did her story in a novel, 
you know, that was not just writing New York, but writing the New York of my childhood. You know, I was I was eight years old in 1977. And that was that was that was the New York I grew up in. So, yeah, I've I've, I've contrived all sorts of feeble excuses to say things. <laughs> it's, it's what I know well. And so I can write about it with authority because it's where I'm from. When you were putting together a furnace seal, and, actually, and let me backtrack for a second. Like, what's the significance of the title? If I mean, if it's not too spoilery, there's a. Uh, it's not really uh, spoilery because it's right there in the uh, epigraph of the book. It's from a uh, a William Blake poem, um, and and the Blake poem, which is quoted at the beginning of the book, is apt for, for what happens in the book. The sealed furnace is basically. Uh, I don't want to get too specific because, as you said, it is kind of spoilery. But suffice it to say, it 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 fits once you finish the book. <laughs> um, but I specifically took it from a Blake poem. Uh, William Blake is one of my favorite poets, and I and I, I particularly like using his work. I, I read it as an ebook, and I think when I got it onto my Kindle, I think it must have skipped right past that and right into the first page. So I think I missed ah, that entirely. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. No, there is an epigraph with uh, the whole quote there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. It, it's it'll skip past. It's one of my frustrations with with uh, Nook, Nook and and Kindle both do this, where they will uh, jump past the dedication and and the acknowledgments if they're in the front of the book, and the epigraph and and stuff like that. This is all stuff that you know we're, is there for people to read. It's in the front of the book in particular, so people will read it. But the exact uh, – there's actually two – I'm sorry. There are two quotes. One, but the one that the title comes from is the Blake poem, A Divine Image. And the full uh, quote is, a human, the human dress is, in, is forged iron, the human form a fiery forge, the human face a furnace sealed, the human heart its hungry gorge. And then there's another uh, quote, uh, why will you die, O Eternals? Why live in unquenchable burnings? Which is from the first book of Urizen and considering that it's a book about immortals who were killed. Yeah. That contextually makes sense now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, when you were putting this story together, again, it's it's urban fantasy, and and I mean, and we have a a marketplace that has a, a lot of variations on this idea of exploring the magic in the everyday. What was your first like sort of genesis for this idea? How did it evolve over time, and how were you working towards you know setting up to be very much your own thing? It was actually inspired by working for the U.S. Census Bureau in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. I got to explore the Bronx a lot, including parts I hadn't gone to regularly. And it, it it's what got me thinking about the possibility of, of setting a fantasy story here. That's what got it started, was the idea of, of uh, using fantasy to explore my home borough. It just sort of, uh, it, it grew out from there. I created the character of Brom Gold for a different thing that still hasn't actually been published anywhere. Uh, and I sort of carved him out because uh, of that. And actually, what's funny is the thing that Brom was part of originally that proposal, which I still eventually want to do something with, actually works better without him. And originally, Brom was supposed to be a supporting character in this. Originally, the main character was the Wardine, was was Miriam Zarelli. And I realized as I was writing it that Brom was doing all the interesting stuff. And so I shifted focus and the, and the book came together much better with Brom as the main character and, and Miriam as a support rather than the other way around. It's it's weird. It's like the 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 inspirations come from so many different things. Sometimes it's it's characters you particularly want to do sometimes it's a setting you come up with in this case it's it's the setting that was already there that, that particularly made me want to which is the second time that's happened i've also got a series of urban fantasy short stories i've written that take place in key west that were inspired specifically by going to key west a lot because i love key west in both cases it was it was wanting to take that setting in particular and do stuff with it what uh thematic elements emerged as you were putting it together like what what did you like find that as you were writing because you I mean you talked about like how like you know you figured out a part of the way through that you needed to shift your focus as far as who your POV character was and all that kind of stuff so I'd imagine that thematically it's evolving over time too I mean was there were there any particular themes that you you found emerging as you went along I'm not sure specifically I part of it was thinking through the consequences of your actions um and the inability of far too many people to do that and and in particular of of a lot of what happens in the book happens either because people didn't think through the consequences of what they were doing or simply didn't have sufficient information. The, the actions of some of Brahms' fellow coursers are taken out of jumping to conclusions and a certain amount of ignorance. The person who we eventually find out is the one responsible for everything happening, he says, trying to avoid spoilers, uh, <laughs> is, comes in many ways from a position of ignorance. And it is that ignorance that causes a lot of the problems and unintended consequences also. And, and even intended consequences. And I think that that's a lot of it is because is I, I 
that that's something I see in everyday life where people don't consider the other person's point of view. They don't think through the consequences of what they're doing. They don't examine things sufficiently or act on insufficient evidence. And so I think that that was a lot of it, because if people had actually thought stuff through, a lot of what happened in the book wouldn't all the bad things that happened in the book wouldn't happen. The phrase that, that I thought of when I was going through it was like the arrogance of good intentions of how often you have people who they really do mean well or they, you know, or they're doing things that they think are right. But the righteousness that comes from that standpoint means that they make a lot of choices that are not very wise or are not very considerate. Um, there's there's a pretty big cast of characters in, in this book. And I think that makes sense in an urban environment where, you know, any one of us on any given day might be surrounded by two to 30 people that we know, you know? And so you've got a lot of people running around, but there's a, there's a few of the other coursers. And in particular, there's this guy named Bernie who is, you know, kind of always ready to go off half cocked. Everybody knows that he's a, a little bit dangerous and very arrogant. And he's that guy who, who I think always has what he thinks of as good intentions, but that standpoint gives him the sort of mental leeway to act arrogantly and uh, and with insufficient information. So yeah, I think that all goes together. I think he's a good example of that kind of thing. And it's not everybody. I mean, the 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 four immortals who who are targeted uh, in the book are all people who were very selfless and knew the consequences and were willing to accept it anyway in order in order to serve the greater good. That's not unimportant either. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, everything that, that Miriam and Brahm and, and Velez, for that matter, do, while, while yes, Brahm and Velez are concerned about getting paid, they are also concerned with, you know, doing what's right. So there, there's that as well. Yeah, Vel- Velez is as a supporting character in the story who – it should be noted that while Brahm is a courser and is trying to take care of all this stuff, he's not actually a magic user himself. Outside of, like, getting his hands on some talismans or some various things that he can activate simply, he doesn't wield any kind of magic. He has to hire in these other freelancers to do that. Velez is one of those those characters. And I thought that was an interesting take on it, that this is not a guy who's coming in like a, you know, a Jim Butcher-esque kind of character, like, wielding a ton of magic or whatever. Instead, he's a guy who's – just kind of getting it done as best as normal human can and then tagging in these other guys. And even they are people who use magic and are <laughs> that occasionally are reluctant to do so because they're like, this is a little bit bigger than y'all think it is. You know, I thought that was an interesting touch. <laughs> and, and again, these are just guys with relationships, guys with personal problems, guys with fun- money problems, you know, and, and, you know, Brom, Brom has a, a spectacular case of, of not being able to get his act together and, and constantly forgetting important things he's supposed to be doing. You know, every, everybody's got their own set of foibles and such and yeah i thought I, I it just made sense that people would be specialized you know there would be certain things just just like you have like with the for example with the medical profession you know you have your urinals and throat people you have your surgeons you have your gps you have your whatever you know so you, you've got you know your neurologists your your oncologists and so on so it's same thing with with magic you've got people who have particular things that they're good at so that's that would be part of it as well and and velez was not intended to be he was another one who sort of just sort of threatened to take over the book um he was really <laughs> supposed to be in the that first part and, he went, and i wound up just i just i like the rapport between him and Brahm. That, that's probably going to continue throughout. I've got three books under contract right now with Wordfire, so there are two more books planned. I, I don't, I don't have titles yet for the second and third books or pub dates yet either, because Wordfire doesn't schedule the book until you turn the book in, which is a smart business practice on their part. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do intend to do more with it, and and, and yeah, we'll definitely be seeing more of Miriam and more of Velez, and uh, also more of um, the Yoruban uh, goddess who shows up. Uh, she, she will be back. And some of the other characters as well. So, Brahm struck me as a like a very quintessentially millennial hero or a millennial protagonist because of the, the sort of a gig economy nature of his lifestyle. And like you said, like he's a guy who's who's trying to kind of keep his crap together. I'm like he's burning it at, at both ends all the time. He's always running ragged. I mean, in this book, like in the first chapter, you know, he's trying to wrangle a unicorn and he gets kind of jacked up. And in a lot of fiction, people take some licks and then they just kind of shrug them off and it's like, oh, I got the hell beat out of me and the two chapters later, they're not thinking about it anymore. Brom is hurting through the entire novel. There's not a time where his ribs aren't still sore from getting jacked up by a unicorn. And I thought between like the sort of gig economy thing and the fact that like he's still dealing with repercussions of minor story elements that happen early on was kind of refreshing to see somebody who's not Superman. I, I actually first created the character of Brom a very long time ago. And and the first Brom story I wrote 
was in 2011, which was in a, an anthology called Liar Liar. And I actually started writing a Furnace Seal in, originally in 2011 as well. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't really think of him as being millennial for that reason, just because he couldn't have been when I started writing the book. Having said that, um, the gig economy thing is something I've been living for 20 years. So <laughs> a lot of that is, is more an artifact of me having been freelance since I, the year I turned 29 than, than anything. Uh, the, the other part of it is just a personal bugaboo of mine because uh, it frustrates me constantly to see people in fiction who, when they are hurt, either recover completely in an unrealistic time frame or die instantly. It's like there's no middle ground. And that that's frustrating. And it it just it irritates me. It's one one of the things that that just bugs me. I I and I've I've tried to address it in some of my tie-in fiction. For example, I did a CSI New York book that had Flack dealing with the fact that he still has to take painkillers because he was in a bomb explosion at the end of one season. And it was never mentioned after that. This is something he'd be in treatment for regularly. He'd have to be he'd be on pain pills for months while it healed, stuff like that. On the West Wing, when when Josh and um, and Donna finally got to bed together, and they're in bed together, and I'm wondering where the scars are because Josh got shot at the end of the first season, and Donna was also in a in a bomb explosion. There should be scars everywhere. That bugs me. It bugs me a lot, and it takes time to recover from injuries. It's one of the things I actually loved about, of all things, the uh, the Scream movies from about 20 years ago. More than that now, jeez. Uh, but in the in the second movie, the survivors of the first movie all had various injuries they were dealing with. You know, David Arquette had nerve damage because he got stabbed. You know, um, Jamie Kennedy still had scar tissue all up and down his neck, stuff like that. And and you don't see that nearly often enough. And that that's something that that not just in in the Brown books, but just in general, is something I try to address. Is that when people get hurt, it they don't recover instantly. Hell, Cooper Giles on Buffy the Vampire Slayer should have tremendous amounts of brain damage at this point, given the times he got conked on the head. Right. <laughs> There, you know, there's a lot of things you, you talked about, like the the instant kill versus the shrugging off. Like, and there's always the 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 thing I've always found funny in fiction. It's like people will shrug off like bullet wounds all the time, but like if you get shot with a bow and arrow, you're dead, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. But also, if you get shot in the shoulder, the likelihood is that for the rest of your life, you will never be able to raise your arm and any higher than your own shoulder, you know, or not even that high necessarily. That's a serious wound. And usually, you know, a shoulder wound is, is shorthand for not really hurt. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Oh, it just passed through no vital organs or things like that. You know, there's a lot of like just hand waving. There's an episode of like supernatural where, uh, where Dean takes a bullet. And then by the end of the episode, they're like, Oh, it's a clean, you know, clean wound. No big deal. They just patch him up, but he walks it off. And, uh, and granted those guys are something special as far as how many times you can murder them and they, they come back. But, um, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> something when I've talked to young writers sometimes where I think, especially when you're younger, you kind of have this feeling of being bulletproof. Um, and I'm like, look, a few, like years ago, I stepped in a molehill that collapsed underneath my foot and I rolled my ankle and I sprained my ankle and I had to do several months of physical therapy and I still have to be mindful of it all the time because it's an existing injury even years later. And that was, I rolled my ankle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like my hand got damaged when I was a senior in high school and I still sometimes have problem making certain guitar chord shapes because two fingers don't always want to work right. Those things stick around a long time and it's not convenient for fiction and it doesn't feel very heroic but real life sticks around a little bit longer than those things yeah. and that can make for good fiction that's just it that's part of what a heroic character has to overcome it's part of what part of what has to be dealt with the heroes that i find most interesting are the ones for whom it does not come naturally but for but who will still do what needs to be done even when everything is stacked up against them your your spider-man type heroes your 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 Buffy type heroes, your your or even like Worf on Star Trek, who who constantly has the world, the universe dump on them. They still come back and do what's right, regardless, even though they're give the world gives them every reason to just give up and say the hell with this. I'm not I'm not dealing with this nonsense anymore. But they do it anyway. That's the kind of hero who interests me anyhow. And and having realistic consequences to injury just plays into that and can and makes to my mind makes the story stronger. It makes the hero stronger. Absolutely agree. I want to talk about your outlining process. I mentioned at the top that you're you've written a ton of media tie-ins. In fact, you're a grandmaster of the Media Tie-in Writers Association. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. In 2009, the International Association of Media Tie-in Writers gave me a lifetime achievement award. This means I never need to achieve anything ever again. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, I've done I've done a lot of work both as a writer and as an editor for uh, throughout the 1990s and, to, and early 2000s. I did a lot of editorial work first for the late Byron Price, uh, where among other things, I edited an extensive line of novels and short stories based on Marvel comics, and then I also did some editing on the Star Trek fiction line uh, on a freelance basis throughout the early 2000s. So that and plus my prodigious output <laughs> um, in in at this point 33 different licensed universes uh, that I've worked in from Alien to Zorro. <laughs> and and I was so happy when I sold an alien short story because now I can do that. But uh, but no, I've written in a lot. Uh, Star Trek is the most extensive, and I've done, as I said I've done Supernatural, I've done I've done games, I've done movies, I've done TV shows, comic books, whatever. Uh, but with that, uh, which is I assume where you were leading me on with this, is that you have to outline when you're doing a tie-in project because you cannot start writing the book or even the short story or the comic book or whatever until the plot outline is approved by whoever owns it. So I can't write a Star Trek novel until CBS approves my outline for it. I can't write a Farscape comic book until uh, the Jim Henson company approves the plot and so on. That's a big part of it. So, yeah, I and because I started doing tie-in fiction, uh, my first short story sales and my first few novels were all uh, of the tie-in variety. I had to outline. So that's part of my process now. And And honestly, I prefer it. It's kind of like when you check Google Maps for how to get for what directions to take, uh, but then you're on the road and you realize you have to take a different route once you're there. It's good to know that you've got the map set as to tell you where to go first. Uh, and if something happens on the way, you can find an alternate route, but at the very least, you know where you're going. I find that easier. I have the basic idea of where I'm going, what the goal is, what the, the basic plot structure is. And then from there, I can fill in the character bits. And the, the and a lot of times I'll find that the things I did not expect will happen. In in the case of A Furnace Sealed, the werewolves were not originally supposed to be part of the book after we saw them. They were originally just supposed to be at the beginning. That's just one of the things Brom does. And then I realized that my outline didn't actually have a decent climax in it, which is kind of bad in a novel. So, <laughs> and, and then I realized, and I didn't even realize that this is one of those cases where like your brain is smarter than the rest of you. I didn't realize that Malsum which is a, a native god that plays a role in the book, is a wolf god. And it's like, hey, I can use this. I've got werewolves. I had already introduced them early in the book. So I got to bring the four of them back later, which which was not part of my original outline. But as I was writing the book, I was realizing that I didn't, I didn't really have that big uh, climactic thing happening. So, I, and I needed that. And it also, it added text. It added more to the beginning of the book. It, it gave me a chance to write the four werewolves again, because I actually kind of really like them. <laughs> and, uh, Particularly Anna Maria. I like Anna Maria a lot. She's, she, I want to use her more somehow. I just, yeah. but uh, that that's a case where I, I didn't so much deviate from the outline, but had to add to the outline, which does happen sometimes. You know, you'll write a 10 page outline and realize you don't actually have a whole novel's worth of story there, but you don't realize it until you're writing the novel. And sometimes it goes in the other direction too. So, yeah. When you're going into that outlining process, like, I mean, as a tie-in writer, like you said, like, I mean, it's a necessary kind of thing. So I would imagine, like, your outlines are pretty robust. I mean, like, are you are you giving, like, almost like a beat sheet or is it more like full paragraph or, I mean, has it break out? It's usually basically a description. Sometimes I break it down by chapters. Sometimes I don't. It depends on the book. Some books need more than others. And, and also it depends on what the needs of the, the licensor are. Some licensors require a chapter by chapter outline. Uh, others do not. Others don't care. But there are some stories where I will break it down more aggressively. And and again, it depends on the story. Some of them have been very detailed, you know, as many as like 30, 35 pages. Some of them have only been three or four pages for entire novels. It really does vary. There, there's no set way to do it. But basically, it's a description of what happens. Um, mostly, it's mostly plot focused more than it is character focused. The character stuff tends to come out in the in the developing of the plot. The answer to most questions about writing tend to be it depends <laughs> and uh yeah it depends and doing the tie-ins if you're let's say you're two-thirds of the way through the book and you realize that the, you're going to have a deviation in plot because you figured out a better way to do it or you figure out something that doesn't work i mean i know this doesn't apply to, to a furnace sealed but like to the tie-in work is this something you have to go back to the, the licensees and be like okay there's going to be a change in here can i get you to sign off on it usually like as an example there was a star trek novel i did um i did this uh set of books that took place on a Klingon ship. Uh, most of the characters on it were ones who had appeared like once or twice before on an episode of either Next Gen or Deep Space Nine, and, and I was using them as part of the crew. At one point, I'm in the midst of writing a book, and I didn't even realize I intended to kill this character until I'm writing his death scene. <laughs> but I, I'm writing, and I realized he's got to die. There's no way to, there's no other way to, to do this properly. 
And so, yeah, I had to send an email to my editor and say, uh, Marco, um, could you email the licensor? It was Paula Block at the time. Could you email Paula and say, I need to kill this guy and make sure they're okay with it? Because this, like, if it was a character I had created, it would have been fine. But this was a, this was technically a screen character. He only appeared in one episode of Deep Space Nine, but I was still killing him and I still need to get permission for that. So, so yeah, that does happen. Uh, and yeah, you usually usually have to run it by them first. Some more than others. It depends on you know for something like Star Trek, which is very detailed and complicated, and has six TV shows and thirteen movies, not to mention other novels and comic books that you might be tying into. Then there's a certain amount of coordination. So you have to if if there's a deviation, yeah, you got to clear it. I wrote an alien novel that's coming out in July. That one uh, I did have to check. Basically, the novel came up short, so there was stuff I had to add. That I didn't need to run by, but this is uh, Alien is a universe that basically consists of a few movies, which is not that much. And most of the characters in the, in the, that I was dealing with uh, were not ones from the screen. Uh, and the stuff I was adding was flashback material, fleshing out actually Ripley's uh, daughter which was the whole point of the book was to, to flesh out her life. I just, I added more flashback scenes to her life to fill out the book, which was fine with me anyway. I wanted, I wanted to do more of that in any case. It was just, I, I just needed more than what I originally accounted for in the outline, but that, that I didn't need to run past. What are your tools of the trade? You've been in the game for a long time. So I'm interested to see like if your, if your methodologies have evolved a lot over time, or if you've got kind of a, if you figured it out a while ago and you've been sticking with kind of the same stuff. Uh, no, I generally work in Microsoft Word. I mean, it has changed in so far as when I first, I, I'm old enough that when I first started, uh, I worked in uh, on an IBM PC <laughs> with, where, where I used Xyrite, which was really terrible. But no, I uh, I mostly stuck with Word. I, I have heard good things about Scrivener and may change over to it at some point, but I've been using Word for so long and it, I, I don't, I haven't been given a good enough reason to stop using it. It's still pretty much the standard. I mean, even, and even, you know, even if I did work in Scrivener, I'd still have to convert it to Word anyway. And I, I, it's just easier to eliminate the middle person and just work in that program. I wouldn't say Word is necessarily still a good program, but it's the one I'm used to. But it's, it's I mean, the process is basically the same. I, do, I type everything anyhow. I don't do anything by hand. The only thing I do by hand is write checks. And I only do that for my landlord because they, they're old and don't do electronic payments. <laughs> I type very fast. And that's my most comfortable way of working with it. And I usually just, you know, I'll write the outline in Word and then I'll, I'll write the novel in another Word file and pretty much it. It works for me. There was a period there where I, I needed to get out of the house to work. Currently, I live in a very nice place where I have an office that I share with my wife uh, who works as a uh, – she does editing and book production mostly and some office managing and other stuff. So we're both freelance. We're both home. But we have a, a big enough place that we can we can get away from each other if we need to. But we can also <laughs> work together. But it's a very comfortable office and one that I'm, I'm good working in. So I don't, I don't need to go out of the house to write, which I had to for a while, in a previous living arrangement that was not as comfortable as this one. So I would go, but I can theoretically write anywhere. I've, I've done writing in hotel rooms. I've done writing in bars. I've done writing in more Starbucks than I could possibly keep track of <laughs> uh, and other coffee shops. Uh, I wrote two thirds of a Starcraft novel in a pub in Dublin in 2005. <laughs> yeah, anywhere I can take the, the laptop, I can write. And uh, in the time when you're not writing now, what other media are you consuming? Like what TV, books, films, what are you absorbing? All sorts of stuff. I write about uh, pop culture for tour.com. So some of my viewing time is taken up with stuff I'm writing about. Uh, I also have been reviewing things on my Patreon as well. Uh, TV shows and movies that I don't do for tour. Um, I've been reviewing. I've been doing the great superhero movie rewatch for tour.com uh, where I've been covering every single live action movie based on a superhero comic book. That has been going since August 2017. And by the end of this year, I will have caught up to real time. So after that, I have to come up with something else to write. But, um, <laughs> but I've done I've, I've done writing. I've written a, about a bunch of different things for tour, including the various Marvel Netflix series, uh, reviews of various TV shows here and there, and movies here and there, and also extensive rewatches of uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, the original Star Trek, the 1966 Batman, and the Stargate franchise. And that's been fun. And um, and I've been reviewing uh, each new episode of Star Trek Discovery for them as they come out. So I that that's part of what I do. And I, I am slightly obsessed with the Marvel movies, even before I started doing a superhero movie. <laughs> a lot, I like a lot of different things. I don't get to read as much as I'd like, unfortunately. Uh, when I do, I, I tend more toward mysteries and books about baseball, actually. <laughs> and uh, I, I watch I watch the New York Yankees religiously. That's that's my particular sports obsession. I watch a lot of different TV shows. I, I like, I love police procedurals. My other big original novel series is the Dragon Precinct series, which is um, a fantasy police procedural, kind of Law and Order meets Lord of the Rings. 
And uh, and I've, I also have a superhero police procedural that I've got some novellas coming out in next year called The Super City Cops. I've already done one novel and some other novellas in the past. I just I like writing about cops. It's 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 a thing. And I also like watching good cop shows. I like all sorts of different movies, uh, ranging from old classics to more contemporary stuff. Uh, I'm a huge Akira Kurosawa fan. I can watch Citizen Kane endlessly. I can also watch A Few Good Men endlessly. Those are like two of my favorites. Uh, Rage in Harlem. I, 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 that, that's actually one of my favorite movies for no good reason. It's not a particularly great movie. It's from the, the early '90s. It's called A Rage in Harlem, based on an old uh, novel. It's a. I just I love that movie. I don't know why. It's just one I particularly love. Well, nice. Um, well, as we wrap up here, uh, can you tell me where people should be following you? You mentioned you've got like a Patreon re- releasing stuff. Um, so we're on like social media on the web. There on Patreon. How do people find you? Uh, the best way to find me is to go to my website, which is decandido.net, which is just a link dump. It's 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 a very basic web page that looks like it was designed in 1996, mostly because <laughs> 1996. And um, <laughs> but it's just it's just a list of of where you can find me. They're they're ordering links for a furnace sealed for my precinct books and for the upcoming alien novel. And uh, there's also just general links to me on Amazon, Kobo, and Barnes and Noble, and IndieBound. So if you want to order any of my my back catalog, that's you can go there. And it's also got links to my various social media. I have a blog. I have a Patreon, as I said. On on the Patreon, you can get movie reviews, TV reviews, cat pictures. I post a lot of cat pictures, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also excerpts from my works in progress. If you go up as high as ten dollars a month, I do little vignettes featuring my various original characters. For Brom Gold, what I've been specifically doing for most of those is, if you remember from the book, every Sunday night, a bunch of the local coursers get together at a bar on Katona Avenue in the Bronx. I've done a bunch of vignettes that are those gatherings. It's just Sunday night at the Kingfisher's Tale with people telling stories, uh, which is one of my favorite parts of the book to write. And so I've done a bunch of vignettes with that, as well as with the precinct books, with the Super City Cops that I mentioned, the Key West Urban Fantasy, and and my other original things. And then also uh, for a higher tier, you can get full first drafts of uh, stuff I'm working on as well. I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I, I write regularly, as I said, for tour.com. So you can find me there as well. I think that's everything. Like I said, if you go to dependido.net, it's all there. Yeah. And I actually have read a lot of the, because I have to get the tour like, like newsletter and stuff. So I see your articles come through like every week through, through them too. So that's awesome. Well, like we said at the top, a furnace sealed uh, is available now from Wordfire Press and is available through all the online retailers and stuff, as well as a massive back catalog of earlier works and stuff as well. And uh, like you said, I know you're working on two more books so that the, the Bram Gold uh, series will continue on on Wordfire in the relative near future and people should watch your social media and, and website and Patreon for all that stuff. So people should check out this book. Thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious and, and look forward to uh, seeing the rest of the books in the series. Thank you. The home for all Fictitious episodes, reviews, news and more is FictitiousPodcast.com. Follow the show on Twitter and Instagram, where I post as Fictitious Pod. I share lots of writing and book info, along with new episodes and event news. You can also interact with me directly on Twitter, where I'm generally posting about books and general geekery as at Adrian Buskey. You can subscribe to Fictitious on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Podcasts live and die by the support of our listeners. If you enjoy this program, please share your favorite episodes on social media, tell your friends, and write a review on your podcast service of choice. You'll be helping me grow the show and supporting the authors who join me to share their stories and writing knowledge. When you do write a review, drop me a line and let me know so that I can thank you personally. I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. (laughs) 